Chapter 17, Away. At 3.20, Dune took his pillowcase pack, left the school by the back door, and started up Pibb Street. He went fast. The lights had gone out for a few minutes just before three, and he was nervous about being outside. He planned to take the long way to the pipeworks, out at the very edge of the city, to avoid any guards that might still be looking for him. He was filled with dread about Lina. He wouldn't know what had happened to her until he got to the pipeworks, and she either showed up or didn't. All he could do now was run. He raced down Knack Street. It was strange to be out in the city with the streets so utterly deserted. Without the people passing back and forth, the streets seemed wider and darker. Nothing moved but himself, his shadow, and his reflecting feet, or his fleeting reflection in shop windows he passed. In Selverton Square, he saw a kiosk where the poster with his and Lina's names on it had been pinned up. Everyone in the city must have seen these posters by now. He was famous, he thought wryly, but not the w in the way he'd wanted. There would be no glorious moment on the gathering hall steps after all. Instead of making his father proud, he would cause him dreadful worry. This thought made him so sad that his knees felt suddenly wobbly. How could he just vanish without a word? But it was too late now. He couldn't go back. If only there was some way to send him a message. And in a moment, he realized there was. He stopped, fished in his pack for the paper and pencil he had brought, and scribbled on it. Father, we have found the way out. It was in the pipeworks after all. You will know about it tomorrow. Love, Dune. He folded this in quarters, wrote, delivered to Loris Harrow in big letters on the outside, and pinned it to the kiosk. There. That was the best he could do. He would have to trust that someone would deliver it. In the distance, he heard the faint sound of singing. He listened. It was the song of the river, just ending. Far below, like the blood of the earth, from the center of nowhere rushing forth. He sang under his breath, like everyone in Ember. He knew the words of the three songs by heart. He sang along softly with the faraway singers, making the light for the lamps of ember, older than anyone can remember, faster than anything anyone knows. The river comes and the river goes. Up Rim Street now to River Road, he was halfway there. The singers were starting on the Song of Darkness. It was his favorite with its powerful, deep harmonies. He was a little sorry to be missing it. He went up the pot side, street side of empty River Road Square, where another poster hung crookedly on the kiosk, and he was headed toward North Street when suddenly the lights flickered and went out. He jolted to a stop. Stand still and wait. That was his automatic response. In the distance, he heard a dip in the sound of the singing, some startled voices breaking the flow, but then the song rose again, defying the darkness. For a moment, all thoughts vanished from Dune's mind. There was nothing but the fearless words of the song. Black as sleep and deep as dreaming, darkness like an endless night, yet within the streets of ember, bright and bravely shines our light. He sang, standing still in the blackness. When the song ended, he waited. The lights would surely come back soon. For a few minutes, there was silence, and then, far away but piercingly clear, he heard a scream. More screams and shouts followed, the sounds of panic. He felt the panic himself like a hand taking hold of him, making him want to leap up and fling himself against the dark. But suddenly, with a flash of joy, he remembered he didn't have to wait for the lights to come back on. He had what no citizen of Ember had ever had before, a way to see in the dark. He set his pack down, untied the knot at the top, and groped around inside until he felt the candle. Down in a corner, he found the little packet of matches. He scraped a match against the pavement, and it flared up instantly. He held the flame to the string on the candle, and the string began to burn. He had a light. He had the only light in the entire city. The candle didn't cast its light very far, but it was enough to see at least the pavement in front of him. He went slowly along Pot Street, then turned left on North Street. At the end of the street was the wall of the Pipeworks office. When he got to the pipeworks entrance, no one was there. A little cloud of moss came to flutter around the flame of his candle, but otherwise nothing moved in Plummer Square. There was nothing to do but wait. Dune blew the candle out. He didn't want to use it all up in case the light stayed off a long time and squatted down on the pavement, setting, his, setting down his bundle and leaning against one of the big trash cans. He waited, listening to the distant shouts, and at last the, link, the lights blinked, blinked again and came on. Lana was nowhere in sight. If the guards had found her and taken her, but Dune preferred not to think about that yet. He would wait for a while. She would have been delayed by the blackout if she was on her way. He couldn't see the clock tower from here, but it was probably not quite four o'clock. What if she didn't come? The singing was over, the people were dispersing throughout the city, and the guards, no doubt, would soon resume their search for him. Dune clasped his arms together and pressed them hard against his stomach, trying to stop the queasy fluttering. If she didn't come, Dune had two choices. 
He could stay in the city and do what he could to save Lina, or he could go in the boat by himself and hope Lina could somehow free herself and tell the people of Ember the way out. He didn't like either of these plans. He wanted to go down the river, and he wanted to go with Lina. Dune stood up and hoisted his sack again. He was too restless to keep sitting. He walked down to Gappery Street and looked in both directions. Not a single person was in sight. He walked to Plummer Street, thinking that Lina was coming by way of the city's edge as he had to avoid being seen, but no one was there. He didn't even see anyone when he went past Subling Street to the very end of the city. He had to decide what to do. He went and stood in the doorway of the pipeworks. Think, he said to himself. Think! He was not even sure he could make the river journey by himself. How would he get the boat into the water? Could he lift it without help? On the other hand, how could he help Lina if she was in the hands of the mayor guards? What could he possibly do that would not just get himself caught too? He felt sick. His hands were cold. He stepped out of the doorway and scanned the square once again. Nothing moved but the moths around the lights. And then down Gappery Street, Lina came running. She came slantwise across the square, and he dashed to meet her. She was hugging a bundle to her chest. I've come. I'm here. I almost didn't make it, she said, breathing so hard she could barely talk. And look! She folded back the blanket of her bundle. Dune saw a curl of brown hair and two wide, frightened eyes. I've brought Poppy. Dune was so glad to see Lina that he didn't mind at all that Poppy was coming with them. Making a risky journey even riskier, relief and excitement flooded through him. They were going. They were going. Okay, he said. Come on. With his borrowed key, he opened the pipeworks door and they hurried past the yellow slickers on their hooks and the lines of rubber boots. Dune dashed into the pipeworks office long enough to replace the key on its hook, and then they pulled open the stairway door and started down. Lina stepped slowly because of Poppy, and Poppy clung to her neck, unusually quiet, sensing the strangeness and importance of what was happening. At the bottom of the stairs, they came out into the main tunnel and walked down the path to the west until they came to the marked rock. How are we going to get Poppy down there? Lina said, I'll fasten her to my chest. Setting Poppy down, Lina took off the coat and the sweater she was wearing. With Dune's help, she made her sweater into a sling for Poppy, tying its sleeve behind her neck. Then she put her coat back on and buttoned it up. Dune looked doubtfully at this bulky arrangement. Will you be able to climb down carrying her like that? Will you be able to reach around her and hold on to the rungs? Yes, said Lina. Now that she had Poppy with her, she felt brave again. She could do whatever she needed to. Dune went down first. Lina followed. Stay very still, Poppy, she said. Don't squirm. Poppy did stay still, but even so, it was not easy going down the ladder with her extra weight. Lina's arms were just long enough to reach past Poppy and hold on to the ladder. She descended very slowly. When she got to the ledge, she stepped sideways, gripped the hand Dune held out for her, and with a deep breath of relief, came into the entryway. They walked to the back of the entry hall, and Dune opened the steel panel and took out the key. He slid aside the door to the room where the single boat was, and they went in. Dune took his candle from his sack and lit it. Lina unwrapped Poppy and sat her down at the back of the room. Don't move from there, she said. Poppy put her thumb in her mouth, and Dune and Lina set to work. Dune's sack went in the pointed end of the boat, which they decided must be the front. They put the boxes of candles and matches into the rear of the boat. It was clear they'd been designed to go there. They fit snugly. The poles labeled paddles were a mystery. Lana thought maybe they were weapons meant for fending off hostile creatures. Dune thought they might fit across the boat somehow to make railings to brace yourself against, but he couldn't get them to work in this way. Finally, they decided just to leave the paddles in the bottom of the boat and figure out what they were for as they went along. Dune dripped a bit of wax on the floor and stood his candle up in it, so he'd have both hands free. Let's see if we can lift the boat, he said. With Dune at the rear and Lina at the front, they found they could lift the boat with ease, it was amazingly light, even with the boxes and pack inside it. They set it down again. The next step was to get it in the water somehow and then get it in themse- and then get in it themselves. We can't just drop in it, Lina said. The river would grab it right away. That must be what the ropes are for, said Dune. We lower it in by holding on to the ropes and tie the ropes to something to keep it from moving. To what? They must have put a peg or something in the wall to tie it to. Dune went back out to the ledge of the river and got down on his knees. Leaning over, he felt with one hand along the bank below. At first, there was only smooth, slippery rock. He moved his hand slowly back and forth, up and down. River water splashed against his fingers. At last, he felt something. A metal rod attached to the river wall, like the rungs of the ladder they had climbed down. I've found it, he called. <coughs> he got up again and went back to the boat room. Let's carry the boat out, he said. 
He and Lina lifted it, taking small steps, moved it forward. As they went out the door, Poppy began to wail. Don't cry, Lina called to her. Stay right there. We'll be back in a second. They carried the boat right to the edge of the water and set it down carefully, its front end pointing downstream. Dune knelt again, feeling for the metal rod. Hand me the end of the rope, he said. Which rope, Lana thought for a second. She realized it had to be the one attached to the side of the boat nearest her. That would be the side closest to the riverbank when they put the boat in. She uncoiled the rope, ran it around the boat, and handed its end down to Dune, who lay on his stomach with his head hanging over the edge and knotted the rope to the metal rung in the wall. He got to his feet again, wiping water from his face. Now, Dune said, we can put the boat in the water. Another wail came from the boat room. I'm coming, Lina called, and dashed back for Poppy. She hoisted her up and spoke into her ear in the voice she used for announcing an exciting game. We're going on an adventure, Poppy. We're going for a ride, a ride in the water. It'll be fun, sweetie, you'll see. She blew out the candle Dune had left and carried Poppy to the river's edge. Are we ready, said Dune? I guess we are. Goodbye to Ember, Lina thought. Goodbye to everyone. Goodbye to everything. For a second, a picture of herself arriving in the bright city of her dreams flashed into her mind, and then it faded and was gone. She had no idea what lay ahead. She set Poppy down against the wall of the entry passage. Sit here, she told her. Don't move until I tell you to. Poppy sat, her eyes wide, her plump legs sticking out in front of her. Lina took hold of the rope at the rear of the boat. Dune took hold of the rope at the front. They heaved the boat up and stretched sideways to swing it out over the water. It tipped alarmingly from side to side. Let it down, yelled Lina. They both let the rope slide through their hands and the boat fell and hit the water with a slap. It bounced and rocked and pulled against its tether, but Dune's knot held. The boat stayed in place, waiting for them. Here I go, cried Dune. He bent over, gripped the rim of the boat with one hand, turned backward, and stepped in. The boat tipped sideways under his weight. Dune staggered her step and then found his balance. All right, he yelled. Hand me Poppy. Lina lifted Poppy, who began to howl and kick at the sight of the bucking boat in the churning water. But Dune's, ar Dune's arms were right there, and Lina thrust her into them. A second later, she jumped in herself, and then all three of them were tossed to the floor of the boat by its violent rocking. Dune managed to get to his feet. He hauled on the rope that held the boat to the bank until he was close enough to reach the knot. He struggled with it. Water splashed into his face. He yanked at the knot, loosened it, pulled the rope free, and the boat shot forward.